It's bee day, people. So I dressed up as pasture, which in hindsight may have been a bad idea because I'm allergic to bees. We have a food chain and whatever you introduce that's harmful will eventually reach us. It's, it's not possible to, to live as farmer, as a small farmer. The next generation isn't connected to, to nature anymore. I think it's, it's like, it's a, it's, it's a madness that we allow insecticides and pesticides to be used in Europe. Why do railway companies use pesticides in the first place? Because there's a lot of weed on the rail tracks, so they want to get rid of that. There's a quite good pesticide law in Europe which says that any pesticide that's harmful to human health or, or damages the environment should be banned. But in practice we see that it's not happening. Bio um, produce uh, agricultural chemicals, but they also provide the solutions to remove varroa from the bees that are no longer uh, strong enough to withstand pathogens. And they produce medicines when we get sick of pesticides. <laughs> yes, exa that's exactly what I mean. A perfect circle. Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine production. This is a talk show with guests from all over Europe where we discuss the latest buzz. I'm Mireka Kinga Pop, the editor in chief of said Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. And we are also a co founder of the Display Europe platform. Check it out! Display Europe is a new digital platform offering content in 15 languages from all over Europe. And today, we're talking about bees, the tiny creatures that help our ecosystems thrive. So much so that it is estimated that bees are responsible for pollinating one out of three bites of the food we eat. And without them, we'd be living off of a very limited diet of rice, wheat, and maybe potatoes. So much carbs. Pollinators rank not only many types of insects, such as moths and butterflies, but also some birds and tiny mammals among them. But bees are certainly the most effective at this task, as they spend most of their life collecting pollen to feed their offspring. Contrary to popular belief, not all bees make honey, though. In fact, less than 4% of the total population of 20,000 species around the world do. This misconception has contributed to the erasure of the ones that actually require our attention as they continue to face real threats of extinction. These threats are predominantly human-made, and they range from industrialized agriculture to, well, global warming. Since the Save the Bees movement started to take up steam in the early 2010s, individual efforts at bee conservations have been on the rise, creating pollinator habitats, decreasing the use of pesticides, and investing in beehives are all common examples of how some humans rush to save the bees, sometimes without really knowing which ones to tackle. Although the number of honeybees keeps decreasing, research argues it's the non-honey and non-hive producing native bees that we should be looking more close into. And although honeybees are crucial for the environment, they sometimes contribute little to nothing to pollination. They can spread diseases and are not native to many plant species, which require native bees to pollinate them. It's almost like industrial farming wouldn't solve the problems that industrial agriculture created in the first place. In 2006, when beekeepers began noticing the disappearance of their hives over the winter, a phenomenon called colony collapse disorder, a crisis was declared. Campaigning about honeybees has raised awareness about the loss of other native wild bees as well. And beekeeping has proven to be not just a great hobby, but also a way to reconnect with nature and our surrounding environment. This is ever more crucial at a time when we have become very alienated from the species that preserve our lives, whether through a direct transactional relationship with, say, the honeybees that produce vax and the liquid gold that we all know and love today, or through a more symbiotic one where we depend on wild bees to pollinate our crops. Beekeeping became a popular practice amongst environmentalists who want to stop bees from going extinct. However, Existing resources in urban spaces are not enough to sustain the rapid growth of hobby hives, which could negatively impact biodiversity. Our editor, Sarah Baring, describes this as a mass raising of cows on urban rooftops without having enough grass for them to graze. So, what is a benevolent and responsible bee enthusiast to do? We hear more about them from our guests. 
Sarah Waring is our very own staff editor at Eurozine and the author of the book Farming for the Landless, New Perspectives on the Cultivation of Our Honeybee. She has written extensively on beekeeping as a farming practice across Europe. Harald Kika is from the Sonnwendgarten here in Vienna. It's a community garden in the 10th district where members are getting active and creating a place for gardening and neighborly exchange. He will be talking to us about the project, the practice of beekeeping and hopefully also showing us some bees. Gerge Schimon is an environmental chemist and a Greenpeace chemicals expert. He is also the senior chemicals officer of the Pesticide Action Network Europe. Gerge deals with the analysis of domestic air pollution research, draws attention to the chemicals found in our everyday life, and explores areas contaminated with dangerous toxins. What a fun line of work! Hello and welcome. Thanks for coming on the show. The obvious greatest culprit in the decline of bees worldwide, I assume, are pesticides. Can you walk us through the problem, please? I believe that pesticides have a like, really important role in the insect decline we face globally. And no surprise, insecticides are designed to kill insects, and bees are insects. All over the world, they start try to protect bees more or less. But in reality, I see that most of this these legislations basically fail to, to fulfill their the, the, uh, original purpose to protect insects and bees. Basically for bees, it's, it's impossible to avoid uh, the exposure to, to, to different pesticides. They try to protect bees just with uh, checking the acute toxicity of, of the different chemicals. And they did not consider basically at all sublethal effects. Pesticides like herbicides, like glyphosate, and many fungicides are either directly uh, undermining bee health. The gut microbiome of bees is completely distracted by uh, uh, glyphosate. So in the presence of certain fungicides, some insecticide considered to be as non-bee toxic became like even thousandfold more directly toxic to bees. Pathogens like nozema or varroa mite uh, is much more lethal uh, to bees and, and much more dangerous to beehives if bees were exposed to pesticides, even not insecticide, but quite often to like, like you know, non-bee toxic uh, pesticides. It's almost like spraying agrochemicals without a second thought wasn't a good idea. So we don't only spray uh, pesticides in, in, in agriculture, but we use a lot of pesticides, unfortunately, in urban areas. Uh, we are using much, much more pesticides than many people would believe. But this problem takes me uh, to Sarah to talk about pasture and, and habitat. Because when we talk about pollinators, we often tend to think about uh, domesticated bees, for instance. I feel like there is less weight attributed to the problem of just pasture, wild pasture, non-domesticated pasture disappearing. Most people might think first and foremost about the honeybee because it's um, so prolific uh, thanks to our engagement with bees. Um, but of course there are many, many, many wild bees and other pollinators uh, that we rely on and uh, that kind of abundant, but their numbers are dwindling. For honeybees, uh, they pollinate broadly. Meanwhile, you have wild bees that are much more specific. They'll kind of... Um, burrow in the ground if they're solitary bees. Um, bumblebees have small colonies which also sort of take uh, places in, in the ground and, and we are um, reducing uh, the spaces in which uh, insects can uh, live and breed and keeping bees in the city bringing insects into a concrete environment. If we kind of continue to concrete over land, then we're reducing the amount of habitat for, for these creatures. Harald, how do you come to, to urban beekeeping and how does this work with your community? Because my understanding of like a public park would be that the, le the less insects, the better for families, you know, nobody wants their children to be surrounded by stinging bees, or do they? Does this change? So this is a big problem in the cities. Uh, 
to be connected to nature. So that's my personal way to reconnect to, to nature. And yeah, in the community garden, we had the idea to have bees and for pollination and for bee awareness. So we're doing a lot of uh, bee programs with the schools and kindergartens. I think the, the pesticide problem is not that big as, as an, on, in the surroundings. Mm -hmm. Vienna um, doesn't use much or no pesticides now, and also the railway company stopped it. Because we have seen that already German rail company phased out pesticides. Budapest started also uh, to phase out pesticides in the city parks. Why do railway companies use pesticides in the first place? Because there is a lot of weed on the rail tracks, so they want to get rid of that. Deutsche Bahn was the single biggest user of glyphosate in Germany. And when they phased out, they started like f hot foams of water and so on to use. Of course, it's a bit slower process and maybe it's a bit more expensive, possibly. But of course, if you look at the external costs for human health, environment, bees, everything, then obviously, it's supposed to be much better for the globe. And now a word from today's host, which is the Erste Foundation Library here in the 10th district in Vienna. This is a knowledge hive serving both the research needs of scientific communities and the general public. Check them out. Thank you guys for hosting us. Tell me about the example that became kind of a culture wars moment in Budapest when this current leadership of the city decided to avoid clipping grass in certain areas and designated them as bee pastures. It's kind of funny because some districts led by the conservatives already uh, protected some areas for, for, for bees and for pollinators but the uh, new Budapest municipality made a program for it. And they said that they, for instance, facing out glyphosate in city parks, so they are using certain insecticides. There are a lot of cities all over Europe. There's a good network of pesticide-free towns. In Hungary, I keep on hearing from uh, that because of invasive species, they still want to use uh, pesticides. I think the good examples have to be spread all over. But there's this like very industrialized idea of what a garden or a park is supposed to look like. Harad, how would you go about designing a space where pollinators and humans can have a safe way of engaging with each other? Uh, we have already a best practice example here in Helmut Zilk Park. Uh, so uh, one third of the grass is cut for the people and the children and two thirds uh, stays and grows all the year. You can hide treasures in there, which as a small kid would be very favorable. There isn't really a systematic understanding to why we cut grass and when and how that happens. But is it quite that simple? Is it this one thing, mowing the lawn? Or, or is there something else that the urban individual who doesn't engage with agriculture on a bigger scale or natural landscapes, they can actually do? You argue that urban beekeeping can go too far or, or is it really a whole-scale solution? There's been a um, huge campaign to save the bees, um, which in itself has a lot of merit. But as a result, uh, a lot of people thought, well, actually, the best way of saving a bee then is to have a hive. My outcome is that's not necessarily the case. It depends on very much on uh, where you live, what provision there is as forage for these insects that, that you're introducing into your environment. Much more useful is to be involved in um, flower campaigns where the planting is uh, being instigated within your environment. I would advise everybody to, to like, if they want to grow something in the garden, to grow it like organically, because you wouldn't be an agriculture expert, or quite unlikely you would be. So if you use pesticide, there's a quite big chance that you uh, pollute yourself or your neighbors. Don't use insecticides in your garden against mosquitoes, but use a repellent, which just keeps the mosquito away. Please try to use, instead of insecticide, repellent on your cat or your dog. And think from bee perspective when you're using uh, insecticide when, on, your, on your animal. If you want to avoid using pesticides, an important issue is that what plants you choose to your garden. I always have this big, um, big debate in my family where uh, a bunch of my family members 
prefer to use these like chemical repellents and I'm always like, just close the freaking mosquito screen for the love of God. For the case of mosquitoes, I think physical barriers are, for instance, and Obviously. for the home would be a much better solution. And also that's something you breathe in as well. We have a food chain and whatever you introduce that's harmful to um, creatures, uh, what we consider to be like a lower level will eventually reach us. There are um, glyphosate cases now going to court and huge damages, billions and billions of pounds worth of damages are being have to be paid by Bayer. We now know that people have, are getting cancer from these products. If you want to know more about European news and see what the Display Europe portal has to offer, check out Vox Europe's press review articles and short video recaps. Initially dubbed the People's Olympics, this summer's Olympic Games in Paris are all about business and widespread social violence, Francesca Barker explains. Also, subscribe to the Display Europe newsletter. Display Europe's newsletter is currently covering the future of food in Europe. This edition delves into the EU's climate policies and greener alternatives, so make sure to subscribe to it to receive all pressing content on the topic from partner journals. You also brought up in our conversations the issue of viewing pollinators and bees as a, an economical or ecological uh, sort of service, quote unquote, provide in an economical sense, which is very problematic. It's a complicated issue because uh, ecosystem services are an attempt to, to frame the need to put a value on the nature around us uh, within economic terms. Bees, in my book, I, I kind of term it as a pollination service provider. China, it was a, a, kind, of, um, a kind of a bit of a meme at one point that um, their pollinators were dying, and so they started to pollinate by hand with Which paintbrushes. Which is insane. It is it, insane. It's insane it's, levels <laughs> of work. Yeah, it's, it's uh, really not uh, cost productive unless you have a huge, huge workforce. Um, do we want that? You know, is it even practical? But I mean, why <laughs> when, you know, the, there's already a, a natural method, if you like. You try to protect what's valuable from human perspective, which is, uh, I believe, not a proper right approach or not a 21st century approach, uh, because we want to protect pollinators. And for that reason, there is a new uh, bee guideline, for instance, which just came into force recently. We not only protect honeybees, uh, but even wild bees. We allow 10% of the bees uh, to be, uh, to be uh, you know, uh, lost due to a treatment, we believe it's too much. I think it's, it's like, it's a, it's, it's a madness that we allow insecticides and pesticides to be used in Europe, which basically can kill all insects in the agricultural area where, where they are being used. So like all non-target species can be dead. So I really believe that we need completely new understanding of what chemicals and pesticides we, sh we, we should allow to be sprayed out to the environment. Why we have a biodiversity strategy in Europe? Because we want to stop species to be extincting, and that's what's happening now. And this biodiversity strategy uh, and also the farm to food strategy clearly says that by 2030 we have to half the pesticide use in Europe, including the use of the most harmful pesticides. And now it's 2024 already, and Europe hasn't adopted any legislation to basically implement this, 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 this target. I think there is a great logical fallacy in here. My impression is that oftentimes these decisions are not rationally made. We have to produce the data and the facts, but we cannot pretend that everything going on on the legislative decision-making, macroeconomic level is a rational thing. What Harad has pointed out, having a, a personal relationship with the natural environment is so key here for someone to understand even the basics. It's, it's not possible to, to live as farmer, as a small farmer, so everybody is working now. And so our, the next generation isn't connected to, to nature anymore. When you say it's not possible to live as a farmer, 
I assume you are referring to the fact that small-scale farms are going extinct and agriculture yes. is, is happening on bigger and bigger scales, on almost what we would call latifundia. We haven't yet talked about the obvious elephant in the room, and that's climate change. How does climate change affect pollinators? If you have ex more extreme weather, like very high temperatures, very dry areas, then extreme, you know, a lot of rain, it means that a lot of native uh, species will just die out and leave the room for invasive species. It will definitely decrease biodiversity. We know that different pathogens and bee disease are one of the major factors of, uh, of killing bees, especially honeybees. Like if, if you ask a, a beekeeper that why bees are dying, they will answer that because of varroa, because uh, mite, because of nozema. And obviously climate change really helped to spread viruses, mites, all different pathogens. So in that sense, uh, chemical agriculture and climate change together brings the consequence that bees are be uh, dying because of pathogens. Only the extreme heat and the extreme dry condition can be like deadly and lethal to be uh, co uh, colonies because, for instance, if they don't have nothing to drink, a wild bee colony, then they will just die out. You have whole areas where, where wild bees are completely disappearing due to the climatic changes. And now, let me introduce today's sponsor, Otto von Bismarck, the plush otter. He supplies the show with cuddles, an unconditional fuss on a stressful production day. Thank you, Otto von Bismarck. You can also become a supporter of the show, and you don't even have to snuggle me. All I ask is that you pledge your support at patreon.com slash Eurozine, that is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this program. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford, and you'll get access to bonus materials, invitations to the tapings of the show, and even get to submit topics and questions. Although we did have an exceptionally wet year last year in 2023, the tendency in the vast majority of, of mainland Europe is severe drying out. And in Eurozine, we have just published a pretty big focal point in collaboration with the Green European Journal titled Breaking Bread, that's dedicated to the issues of water and water scarcity. So if anybody wonders about the issues of water and agricultural production, please hit up the focal point breaking bread. It will be linked in the show notes. But I want to come to you, Sarah, as well, because you drew my attention when you mentioned the global traffic in, um, in queen bees and bee species. A queen is selected because she's a particularly good um, and probably quite placid uh, queen who kind of um, is a good matriarch of the colony. Her eggs can be can used over and over again uh, to produce more and more queens. And what's sort of happened uh, over decades is, is introgression. There's less genetic diversity there. In countries even where queen bees aren't imported because there's concern about a loss of adaptation within the environment, there's a huge uh, queen export program. In Slovenia, for example, they have an, a fantastic um, history of beekeeping and wonderful practices. However, there are some beekeepers, even in Slovenia, that are exporting to as far afield as Japan, I mean. I mean, the export is happening in and within Europe as well. Is this problematic? So when it comes down to everything that um, Gerge has been saying about uh, the resistance of bees to certain chemicals or um, pathogens, uh, they do that much better in the environment where they're used to being. What's interesting in this context is we don't often think about um, the beekeeper's role as well and the bee breeder's or rearer's role. Bee, bee, bee rearing is much better. Bee rearing is done um, within its locality um, in, a, in a way that uh, doesn't involve transportation and it's done sensitively uh, over, over years. Yeah, overbreeding didn't work for the Habsburgs and it doesn't seem to work for the bees either. Our partner institution, Recet, recently had a fellow who studied a very racialized discourse in the, in the 19th century on Balkan bees, where um, basically the local, um, the local scholars understood the 
darker color, actually native bees, as some kind of a degeneration from the lighter and more placid, supposedly superior bees. So this is a very, very charged topic. There was also um, a documentary recently on ORF here in Austria about pride in the grey bee, so the, the Carnica bee, actually, which isn't just an Austrian product, I, ha I hate to say guys, but it's not, um, because she also lives in Slovenia and Italy, I mean, she's cross-border. <laughs> um, I think it's a topic that uh, we could talk about at length. There are sectors of society that would like to racialize nature so that um, they uphold their relatively right-wing views. Um, meanwhile, we have um, environmental campaignists who, kind of activists who also want to conserve. And in a way, the circle can very often come back round and meet. It's complex. There are existing solutions that seem to work, probably need scaling up. So let's start, let's start with policy. What, what would be the solutions that you would like to see in place for the situation to improve? If Europe decided to cut by 2030 to half the pesticide use, and there was a, 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 a citizen initiative signed by more than a million citizens to completely phase out uh, uh, chemical <coughs> pesticide by 2035. Decision makers should follow up on that and make sure that this happens. Currently, there is a kind of bit of a chaos all over Europe, if I look around, that in which city, what pesticide is used in what scale. There is a quite good pesticide law in Europe, which says that any pesticide that's harmful to human health or, or damages the environment should be banned. But in practice, we see that it's not happening. We, we should have guidelines not written by industry, but written by scientists uh, who really care about protecting uh, the environment in general. We should really promote uh, organic wherever it's possible, with, for instance, lower VATs and all different kind of other measures. Both on EU level and both on national level, states could do much, 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 much more to protect biodiversity, to protect bees and pollinators, and to protect humans in general from pesticides. You are endangering the livelihoods of these small-scale vulnerable family businesses like Bayer and Monsanto. You are so <laughs> irresponsible, man. What are they going to make a living from then? Yeah, you're right. If they only have like, you know, gajillions and not bazillions. Bayer um, produce uh, agricultural chemicals, but they also provide the solutions to remove varroa from the bees that are um, no longer uh, strong enough to withstand pathogens. And they produce medicines when we get sick of pesticides. <laughs> yes, exa that's exactly what I mean. Okay, yeah. Perfect circle. Harald, at, on the level of like community engagement, individual engagement, what kind of solutions would you like to see proliferating around Europe? I tell everybody, stop uh, consuming conventional and start organic. So this, from, from the beekeepers and bees perspective, it's, it's perfect. State subsidies are so heavy on a lot of agricultural production. Why do we subsidize so heavily conventional, like chemical heavy production? Then the subsidies are also poured into the chemicals themselves, right? Absolutely. We have farming lobbies that really only are the voice piece of a very few farmers. Um, it's problematic. There are a lot of small farmers that are trying to maintain good, solid, um, organic practices. They're underrepresented, uh, seeing protests by farmers across Europe at the moment. We have empathy, but um, we have to be very careful that um, all voices are heard, and I fear that they're not. If you put a, a beekeeper in a room with an arable farmer, an intensive arable farmer, and and have a conversation with them, sparks will fly. Because these, these two people do not, um, they're not, they don't have the same principles. So we need more support for, for those farmers who, who are doing good jobs. And I think it's important to also mention that the concentration of land ownership and the proliferation of large scale agri industrial agriculture at the expense of family farms, any kind of small scale farming, 
is a detrimental thing. If you want to read more on this, we have a fantastic article about specifically this in Eurozine titled Who Represents Farmers? You also find it on Display Europe. What culturally is perceived as the farmer sort of traditionalist uh, cultural allures associated with this, not really working in the interests of, let's say, family homesteads in most cases. This will be linked in the show notes, of course. Thank you so much for coming and taking the time. And uh, happy bee day, everybody. This talk show is a Display Europe production. It's a new content sharing platform where you can find content on politics, culture, community, and so much more across 15 European languages. Display Europe also doesn't abuse your user data. I know, it's a shocker. Check them out. This program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine bringing you reads from more than 100 partner publications and across dozens of European languages. Now, if you like our tiny animations and want more of them, or you just like what you see and wish to support our work, please go to patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford. And I promise I'm not gonna buy clothes for Otto von Bismarck from it. Instead, you'll get access to bonus materials, invitations to the tapings of the show, and even get to suggest topics and questions. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and the authors only, and they do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACAA can be held responsible for them. Mm -hmm.